So I already talked about preparedness. Um, media importance is another reason, and this gathering is a good time to bring it up after these 25 years. You know, you do you do write and televise and, and uh, do radio shows related to HIV and AIDS. Could we do more? Well, you know, swine flu is going to dominate for some time to come. Surely it deserves the attention. But let's not forget that you have a known problem. You don't have to say, well, this might be a big problem. We have to be with it. Don't, don't get me wrong. But, you know, we have a known deadly epidemic still going on. Give you a feeling for this, one of my colleagues at Institute of Human Virology likes to point out that the tsunami killed about 175,000 people, but that almost that many die every month of HIV and AIDS. So it's like a tsunami a month, and certainly we can't report it like a tsunami a month, but keep that in mind. This is still killing a lot of people. And also, education seems to last only for a little bit of time. When I look back on the history of other epidemics like uh, polio and influenza, the three great epidemics of the 20th century, along with HIV and AIDS, uh, you see the same thing, even as back, far back as the influenza, 1918, 1919, that after 20 or 30 years go by, the human memory span fades. We, you know, we don't need any more expertise and in no serious infectious diseases that could become fatal in pandemic. And it wasn't true in the 60s when I came to NCI, the National Cancer Institute, 1965. Um, but it was true by 1975. You know, these are passe, they're things for tropical disease institutes. We need media to keep punching away, keep reminding there is complacency in the world. We often get that question. We hear of stories in California of people believe, believing people who are so-called HIV denialists. Oh, there's no AIDS, you know, it's just lifestyles and things like this, or other people who feel that with the drugs we can do this or that. So the importance of the media can never be exaggerated in this particular problem because education, though insufficient, is absolutely critical. We used to hear that Africans uh, in many of the countries in Africa wouldn't be able to be treated properly. They wouldn't comply. It was too difficult. And you understand from the great PEPFAR program uh, created in the last administration and with bipartisan support, supported by the current presidency, that the current president, that has been put to pasture. Africans, in our experience, comply more than people in Baltimore and in Washington. So, you know, they can do it very well, especially, I shouldn't say this in front of Kathleen, but especially women. I don't, you know, I'm not sure why, but it's true. They have complied very well. Our institute alone is treating, I don't know, close to 10% of all the people who get treated in the PEPFAR programs in Africa. We've been blessed with two PEPFAR major grants, my colleague Bill Blattner, uh, epidemiology, and Bob Redfield in the clinical division. These things are going very well.